Hello and welcome to the Mutual Fund Show. The average Joe on the street looks at returns that mutual funds have delivered and chooses his funds. The slightly more evolved mutual fund investor looks at ratings, whether it's a five-star rated fund, four-star rated fund, and tries and chooses his funds. Both of which might be right at some point of some points of time, but are not necessarily the correct approach to adopt. Let's talk about what is the correct approach then with Kostu Bilapurkar of Morningstar. And uh, it's Kostu, thanks so much for joining in. It's strange talking about this to you because you guys, your ratings of five star, four star are the ones which are widely followed. Right. Now, let's talk about this. Uh, uh, for a lot of people, and I, I think the SEBI chief's address yesterday mentioned that how a significant portion of mutual fund investors are now women and millennials. Right don't quite have a handle of what's happened in the past and are going out to choose their funds, maybe through the direct route as well. Mm -hmm. How should they go about doing this? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, like you rightly started off saying that uh, a lot of money is actually chasing short-term performance right now, right? So, if, you know, you see a headline printed number saying that XYZ fund has delivered, you know, X percent return and you think, okay, great. Let me get into it. I mean, that's it's probably the most common pitfall of investing, simply because one is, A, you don't know what the construct of that fund was, right? I mean, you're getting into a fund purely basis returns. You don't know if I look at an equity fund, was it a large cap, multi cap, small cap, sort of, that's one. And, you know, there's a standard caveat follows, right? I mean, past performance may or may not be repeated. So if you're already chasing a return that's been delivered, and, you know, you especially a lot of that happens over looking at, you know, one, two, three year returns, which is extremely short term to our mind for a category like equities, right? Uh, if you do that, uh, you know, you could probably be getting yourself into a fund. And, you, and you know, the worst thing is that you, you think that, okay, it'll continue to do that and you don't have the patience. Uh, you know, after a couple of years, you want to swap the fund around into kind of chasing uh, performance all the time. That's probably the worst thing to do uh, because, you know, uh, you need to really get down to dissecting more than just purely looking at performance. I mean, just to start with, is that is that category of fund, is that asset class right for you or not? Do you have the risk return objectives? Do you have the time horizon, right? I mean, if, if I looked at small cap returns, uh, you know, funds uh, at the end of 2017, which look extremely interesting and great, if an investor came in purely looking at the returns without understanding, uh, you know, what a small cap fund entails, uh, there would have been a bloodbath in his portfolio, his sure. portfolio, and, uh, you know, they might have even redeemed. Uh, luckily, data doesn't show that people have actually jumped ship so soon, but, you know, that's something we'd want to tell investors that you shouldn't, you know, you got to get your objectives clearly, your investment time horizon defined very clearly, before you even start thinking about what kind of fund should come in your portfolio. Okay, so let's assume I'm an investor who has his objectives clear. Mm -hmm. I'm a risk-taking investor. I want right. to go out and buy into multi-cap, small cap, right. thematic funds, etc. I don't have an advisor. I believe direct plans is the way to go because there is enough and more shows like these giving advice so I can sure. make do. I'm willing to put a little bit of effort. Mm -hmm. Then I look at the Morningstar advice, which is stars given or right. ratings given right. to a fund. And if Morningstar is given five-star ratings to a fund, mm -hmm. that must be a great fund to invest in. Why is that approach not necessarily the correct approach or not necessarily, why is it a necessary condition but not a sufficient one? Yeah, sure. So, you know, again, I think it's very important to acknowledge that this is what we call the starting point to build a portfolio, right? Okay, explain. So, like ah. you said, you've identified what asset classes, uh, what sub-asset classes, say for instance, you identified, okay, I want to get into a large cap, a multi-cap, mid-cap sort of strategy, if I'm talking the equity side, and similarly, you know, say corporate bond or, uh, you know, short duration fund on the fixed income side, just to take some category names. Beyond that, now you want to figure out which are the funds that I want to get into, right? Now, if I take an instance of, say, a large cap, there could be 35, 40 large cap funds. How do you really drill it down if you want to do your own research? You know, one way is obviously you go to an advisor and they would kind of tell you, you know, they've been in the market, they understand a lot of this, they can tell you what to do. It. But in case you think that you want to devote the time and do it yourself, uh, how do you really drill down? For in fact, you know, even advisors use these tools uh, when they're looking at shortlisting funds, right? The first thing that you can do is, you know, star ratings, right? Star ratings, what they help you in doing is shortlisting or making that list more manageable. You know, so from 40, you can bring it down, you know, look at some of the top rated funds uh, on the star rating basis, and then you bring it down to a more manageable list on which you can do slightly more research to before you make a decision. And I'll come to what you need to do, which is delving a little more into star ratings and what they really stand for. Yeah, right? can you do that? Yeah. Because a lot of people wonder, that right. how is it that Morningstar is a five-star rating fund? Hai. Next year, it doesn't necessarily do well, but there is a method to this. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, we've been running this, uh, you know, from, from since globally since 1984 in India for almost a decade now. 
And the results have actually been pretty pleasing in terms of, you know, just forward looking, if you were to invest into a four or a five star rated fund, uh, across categories, you would generally be better off than investing, say, in a one, two or three star rated fund. Mm -hmm. But again, like I said, uh, you know, there are other things you need to look at. But if I just think about what the star ratings stand for, right, they are risk adjusted returns for mm -hmm. a fund within its peer group. So it's, you know, we're not looking at just pure point-to-point -point performance because, you know, like we talk about base effect and in inflation, GDP, there can be a base effect even with returns. You know, say for funds holding stocks that have been battered so badly over the last couple of years, uh, you know, it's a low, you know, sort of you know, low base effect and you can really, you know, from there it moves up, you could do really well versus, say, a fund that's, uh, done exceptionally well over a period of time, but over the last one year, it's, you know, because we know market cycles can be, uh, you know, kind of go through its blips, different styles, you know, growth's playing out one time, momentum's playing out another time. Uh, but the point is that these star ratings, A, they're long-term risk adjusted returns within a peer group. So that means when we're looking at assigning star ratings, and uh, mind you, this is done within the peer group, we'll look at three, five, and 10-year returns mm. on a risk adjusted basis. Okay. Now, when we talk about, I'll maybe just get a little more, not too much into the math, but just talk about really what it stands for, right, philosophically. Um, now, when we talk about risk adjustment, the most standard definition is like the Sharpe ratio where you look at volatility of a fund. Hmm. Now, volatility, if you look at it, is that, you know, you define that, okay, uh, there's a normal sort of, uh, you know, curve that's oh, there. Yeah. And the spread that, you know, you look at positive standard deviations, negative standard deviations, and volatility is on both sides, right? Positive and negative. Negative. And the biggest pitfall is what we acknowledge of, of the standard volatility measures that it doesn't differentiate between negative and positive volatility, right? Uh, you know, if, if your average or your mean return for a fund is say 1% a month, mm. uh, you know, zero is bad. You know, but plus two is, is also volatility, but it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? You might be taking additional risk to deliver that, but you know, the point is that's not a bad thing. So what our model, which is calling the Morningstar Risk Adjusted Return, actually adjusts for thinking like an investor. So it thinks about, you know, what an investor would think of. So the, the basic driving sort of path to that is that negative returns, and if they're large negative returns, actually get a huge downside. Uh, sort of, you know, uh, attached to it. Whereas positive returns, you know, as you start going up to excess positive returns, the utility function, as we call it, actually starts tapering off. So, you know, so two funds could have actually the same point-to-point -point return. Say mm -hmm. they delivered 15% over the last three years. But one guy was, you know, zip, zip, zip all over the place, minus five, plus 10, you know, uh, whereas another guy consistently pegged along, much chugging along at a much more consistent rate. Now, the guy who's probably been more consistent will actually get a better star rating, and the star ratings reflect that. Because, you know, it's important to acknowledge that investors will come at different points of time. And the point that when we started the show, that, you know, someone looks at the past returns and comes in, someone came in on day one, someone came in on day 500, right? And if it's very volatile, they're going to have extremely different experiences. Mm. But a guy who's more consistent will have a much more, you know, uh, stable experience and the star ratings look to reward those managers who are probably more consistent. Again, this is within the context of a peer group. So obviously you would be comparing a large cap fund with a large cap mm -hmm. fund rather than comparing, say, a large cap to, you know, mid cap or a small cap because obviously, you know, the ranges of walls would be very different amongst these two categories. Is volatility the key driver for a five star or a four star rating or are there yes. other factors uh, which are also so predominant? In fact, what we call the monetary risk adjusted returns is the primary driver, which factors in what we call, uh, you know, the expected utility of returns, which factors in this modified sort of walls. Uh, and uh, it's done over a three, five, and 10-year basis because we clearly believe that, you know, long-term sort of risk adjustment is more useful as compared to looking at very short-term returns. Okay, so let's assume that uh, the star ratings are a starting mm -hmm. point. Keep in mind, viewers, Morning Star, which assigns these ratings, is saying it's a good starting point. It's not the culmination of effort. So keep that at the back of your mind. Once that is done, mm -hmm. what should an investor do in order to build an ideal mutual fund portfolio? Yeah. So the other thing you need to do is, you know, a couple of things, right? Because star ratings are basically looking in the past, right? There's there's no relevance in terms of what the fund's going to do in the future, right? So are, are you saying that uh, high star rated funds haven't necessarily delivered good ratings over the course of the next three, uh, five years? So, okay, so I, you know, I can speak for our ratings. Yeah, sure. Our, our ratings have actually, the efficacy has been pretty good. Okay. So if I look at over the next, you know, if I invested, say, in a four or a five star rated fund, which was as of today, hmm. and held for, you know, three, five, ten years, mm -hmm. uh, the returns of those on an average have been much better than 
say, had you invested in a one, two, or three star rated fund. Oh, so, so your, your empirical study shows that absolutely. investing yes. in high star rated funds over a long period, which is what an MF investment should be, yes. has actually worked. Has actually worked. But again, you know, we don't want to, you know, it's obviously a, it's a pretty sturdy model that's worked. But again, you know, uh, coming back to that point that there's always that, you know, and, and I'll talk about some of the things that could, you know, change, uh, you know, sure, a okay. star rating can potentially not necessarily mean that it's going to do the same thing. You know, simple things like a change in a fund manager, you know, uh, or it's changed the mandate. You know, it might still be operating within a particular group, so it's not really changed categories, but, you know, say a change in fund manager or a change in mandate, for instance, you know, a very diversified sort of portfolio suddenly becoming a very concentrated portfolio running with, a, you know, value or growth style. So these are things that you'll need to keep in mind, right? So when you're you know, when we spoke about shortlisting the funds, you'll need to actually do a little more, you know, since you're looking to do this research by yourself, you'll need to, you know, look at how is that consistency of the mandate been, hmm. uh, you know, over the past period of time. So, I mean, is it similar to what it delivered in the past? You know, so is there something that's changed or is it continue to run as is? And, you know, it becomes very important from the context. We saw the whole categorization, uh, SEBI categorization that happened last year. Obviously, funds changed categories. While I would say that it wasn't a very disruptive move because most funds probably had some changes in the margin, but it's still important to acknowledge, say, someone who was maintaining a 70% large cap portfolio suddenly today is now doing a more 60, 40 sort of portfolio. That's still a 10% shift away. So it's not a dramatic change, but there is a change in mandate that's happened, and you need to see how things have kind of moved, right? That's important. Change in fund manager obviously uh, becomes, uh, and you know, that's where we as Morningstar actually do a lot of deep dive in terms of understanding the people driving. Yeah, uh, I know, you know from uh, our past interactions yeah, as well. I, I, absolutely, and I, I think that's important. Uh, and you know, if you can't do it yourself, you can look at some of the commentary that we write on our own website where we kind of qualitatively analyze uh, some of these funds where, you know, we talk about not just the manager, but even the team that's supporting him. Because what you want is a good manager, but a good backup team supporting him. Because come what may, if, you know, manager leaves, uh, is there a second line of sort of defense that sure. can take over? And then that kind of takes to the investment process, where I spoke about the consistency of the investment process. You know, a classical case would be that uh, someone who's chasing the market rather than actually having a stable process, right? Hmm. Uh, 2017, you had, you know, sort of uh, growth, you know, momentum stocks really do well. Uh, if you're a mal value manager at that point of time, uh, and you've been a stated value manager, if you stuck to your value mandate, you'd have you'd have suffered in that kind of a market cycle, which is fine because that is your mandate. You stuck to it. But if you mm -hmm. started suddenly chasing growth because that's what investors were looking at, uh, you know, you'd you'd it'd be a double-edged sword because you would have missed the large part of the rally, and at the same time, when the markets crashed in 2018, you've kind of fallen off, you know, because you have yeah, been to this sure. high growth moment. So the consistency of the mandate is important. And if you just take a look at historical portfolios, uh, you'll get a reasonable sense of how, you know, some of these things have moved. Uh, you know, so the, the team, the manager, that helps you build conviction on, you know, okay, here's the past performance, but is everything still in place, you know, that I can go and allocate money to a strategy like this. And, and, if, and if it isn't, do the star ratings, is there a possibility that the star rating can very immediately in the next one year veer away dramatically from what it was in the previous year? Have, have such instances uh, happened so frequently? Two things have happened. One is if the mandate by itself has changed very dramatically. You know, mm. uh, you know when the, then the past performance becomes completely obsolete it, to it compare 11, yeah. with it. If that's the case, then we suspend star ratings on that altogether because then it's kind of sending... And you wrong. restart the new we thing. Restart. You know, the other thing I didn't talk about is that we typically wait for a three-year seasoning of the fund. So if there's an NFO, we'll only issue ratings after it's completed three years, whether it's got a demonstrated track record. Because like I said, our star ratings are based on three, five, and 10 years. You know? Okay. So three years is like the bare minimum for a fund to even qualify for a, for a rating. It. Okay. Uh, so that's that's one. But if there's been a change in the margin, you know, so it's not necessary that the fund would completely, you know, the star rating would collapse. Because that's the other important thing to understand that uh, uh, the efficacy is also driven by how stable the star ratings are, right? If your process by itself does not reward long-term risk-adjusted returns, what's going to happen is that today is a five-star, tomorrow will be a two-star. What does that tell investors? That, you know, I came in thinking it was a five-star rated fund, and six months later, it's a two-star rated fund. See, it's, it's almost impossible to, to imagine a scenario that the fund suddenly became yeah. so dramatically bad that it should fall from a five or a two-star. Okay, point well taken. Yeah. So, my, and then the larger question is this, Gostop. When I look at some data that I have, the mm -hmm. equity-based fund average return 
for you know different time periods, but one star, two star, three star, four star, five right. star, or even the fixed income. Clearly, the five star rated funds have done very well over both time periods, 36 and 60 months. This is the equity based fund. Even the fixed income based average returns have looked reasonably impressive. Right. Uh, so, if this is a starting point, mm -hmm. what is it? What else does that customer or the investor need to do right. after he's arrived at a short list based on the star ratings of Morningstar or some of the others, whatever? So, you know, if he's a DIY investor, clearly yes. he'll need to spend some time in, like I said, delving into the the portfolio construct, the mandate of the strategy. Mm -hmm. You know, because you can't be going blind because the star rating, like I said, if it's a change of the margin, but say the manager has changed or the team's changed or the process by itself has changed in terms of, you know, the way the portfolio is being constructed and you start seeing a huge style drift in the way, you know, obviously it won't come over two, three months, but it'll, it'll start showing up over, you know, six to 12 months that suddenly from a particular style it's gone to another radically different style. Now that style may or may, may be good, but we don't know if it's going to deliver the same kind of consistent returns and does the portfolio manager have the wherewithal to do it? You know, so that's something that you'll need to kind of take a qualitative call, and that's something we actively do as Morningstar, you know, in terms of our own qualitative research that we, uh, you know, we put our thoughts out on. Okay, so that is a put in put in the hard hours behind yes, doing a lot yeah. of other qualitative research before you Correct. go out and Correct. Yeah. Um, try and invest the only other in the business. Of this. Yeah, the other option is obviously you know uh, there are financial advisors who are available. Uh, you know, they're obviously you know because if you can't devote that kind of time. You know, clearly a lot of us have so many other things to do. Uh, that's someone who's kind of, you know, on top of these things and he would be in a position because he's obviously in the industry, knows what's been happening and, you know, been tracking some of these funds for a while. They would also be using some of these same tools, you know, to start shortlisting and then kind of move forward to what funds make sense in an investor's portfolio. Okay, but you effectively do believe that as a starting point, even if I have a financial advisor, nothing stops me from doing some research myself because it's only in my interest. Right. But as a starting point, yes. say, at least from a Morningstar experience or a Morningstar back testing, mm -hmm. uh, selecting funds on the basis of the star ratings given consistently over right. a period right. is, is a great way to shortlist funds. I, I would definitely say so, because you know, otherwise you can't wrap your head around 40 funds. You know, Even if you were to put filters like, okay, I'll choose fund sizes above so-and-so, which I said manage, you might, you might end up with you know, a lot on your plate to actually then kind of decide what what's the fund that I want to pick. But this is obviously a signaling effect that this is something that's worked in the past, but like I said, that you need to see that the elements that were helping it work in the past, has that remained stable or not. You know, So I think that's a very important thing that needs to be kept in mind. Yes, it is. Now, viewers, remember when we thought about this piece, we were thinking about whether or not having a five-star rating is the gold standard when it comes to choosing a fund. Uh, what we've learned is that maybe it could be a gold standard rating, but uh, that is only the starting point. After you choose those funds or choose that fund, you have to do your own research to try and figure out if it's a good fit and whether it's a good fit within your portfolio as well, because you might be having some other funds which are similar and maybe you need to diversify as well. So I think that's probably the larger point of this conversation. Kostub, uh, thanks for this conversation. Sure. So this, this summarizes the topic that we wanted yes. to. Uh, but there is something else that I want to use this opportunity to talk to you about. Mm -hmm. uh, there was. Uh, this Amphi meet yesterday wherein, uh, wherein the SEBI chairman laid out some points and I mm -hmm. wanted to understand from you what do you make of this. Uh, some of the remarks appeared scathing, some of the remarks appeared uh, maybe not as tough as the word suggested right. and I want to use these three examples to try and get a sense from you as to what do you think. I mean, so he, he, in one of the things he gave an example saying that based on the study of the liquid schemes it was observed that in 20% of the instances, the average holding in liquid instruments was less than 5% of the AUM as compared to an average net redemption in the schemes of about 19%. <laughs> is this a big dichotomy? Is it a point of worry for somebody who's holding investments in liquid funds and does he or she need to review them? Or you would believe that yes, it is a dichotomy, but it's something that is palatable. Yeah. So, you know, if just kind of step back as to what's been happening with the liquid fund industry, right? So if you look at the large part of the investors that exist in this, are uh, largely institutions and corporates. And uh, a lot of the asset managers, you know, uh, it is kind of an AUM sort of game, so to speak, that, you know, because that is kind of flush money that could come in. But the biggest problem is that money is hot money. It comes and goes, right? Uh, the one thing that, in fact, you know, Mr. Tyagi spoke about it, but they also, you know, announced the board meeting in the, you know, uh, a month and a half back was really about addressing some of these things, right? Where they put in norms for liquid funds, you know, in terms of there's an exit load. Uh, because what happened was that, you know, 
hot money from, say, an institutional guy would come in, and the way the valuation norms were based at that point of time, uh, it's not necessary that a fair value was kind of being derived on the NAV of the funds. And, you know, retail investors who probably stayed put uh, didn't get the best because, you know, uh, what was what was the sort of valued accrued value on that and what it was actually sold at could have been different. So the first thing they did was to look to fix it to a complete mark-to-market valuation. So that means that now there's a complete flow through. Uh, even if there's a, a huge redemption that comes in, it'll be on, you know, it's already been marked on a mark-to-market basis so that, you know, it'll be a more fairer NAV price realization uh, for all investors. So it's not like someone's disadvantaged by large flows coming in. The other thing, obviously, they've done is to address some of those large flows itself, right? Uh, they've put in a graded exit load up to seven days, which is great because, uh, you know, now you, you'll have only investors who have at least a seven-plus-day mm. investment horizon rather than, you know, one-two-day money, you know, uh, to the sizable tune coming in and going out. Uh, then, obviously, uh, you know, you have to hold 20% in cash, the liquid instruments, super yeah. liquid instruments that you can redeem at any point of time, even if there's some large redemptions that come through. So all of this is going to make it a much more cleaner sort of price realization and a uh, product to invest in, you know, from, from a, a perspective of uh, uh, even a retail investor. The important thing to acknowledge is that still it largely is like an institutional product, so to say. You know, I mean, a large part of the money comes in from there. Uh, obviously, we are far behind, you know, some of the other geographies. But if you look at markets like the U.S., even money market funds are largely bought in by retail individuals. So, you know, that, that component of hot money kind of, it's not necessarily, you know, the same there. So, unfortunately, because of the way the industry or, or the where the flows have been coming in, some of these uh, you know, things now SEBI's look to address, and I think it'll be a much more cleaner sort of uh, level playing field in that uh, space now. Okay. Um, the other bit is, um, uh, you know, the expense ratios, and I think um, in amongst other things, he mentioned that they observed that during the inspections, there was a difference in the TER between the direct and the regular plans, and not exactly to the extent of the distribution expenses and commissions paid. And mm-hmm. uh, now, uh, again, uh, one, what does this mean? And two, from an investor's perspective, mm-hmm. does this in any way impact the kind of returns that he would make because uh, the the actual expenses charged by the fund or select fund houses right. might be higher than what they should be in the first place? So, you know what, Sebi, uh, I mean, you know, direct plans have now been in existence for almost seven years now. Yeah. And what they've been kind of refining and what, you know, they've really been driving home is that your various heads of expenses that are there, you know, your management fees, some of the other ancillary custodian, and then there's a distribution fee that's kind of, which is the commission that's paid to distributors, right? So you have a regular plan, you have a direct plan. Now, ideally, what Sebi's mandated that the difference between the two should be, as a percentage, the distribution commission that's paid out on an average on the fund. Can you, can you explain, please, yeah. again? So basically, you know, say, uh, assume that, uh, you know, uh, the expense ratio of, say, an equity fund is 2% for the regular plan. And for, on an average, you paid 0.7% of the AUM as distribution commission, hmm. you know, which is now obviously on an all-trail basis, but let's say 07 on an average is what is paid. So the regular plan should ideally be at 1.3, I mean, just a very simple math. Yeah, 1.3 uh, and so I mean, 0.7 is yeah. 2, yeah. So basically what they're saying is that all the other heads you know, which are there in the direct plan should be on a percentage basis the same as under the regular plan because the only difference should be the distribution which which is embedded into the uh, commissions which are embedded mm. into the regular plan which don't exist in the direct, in that, the should direct be, plan. that should be the difference. Right. And I, uh, you know, we haven't done the analysis ourselves but uh, I'm assuming what the is referring to that that difference is not necessarily, it doesn't add up, you know, which could mean that, you know, maybe some direct plans are actually charging a little higher, uh, you know, on some of the heads. Uh, and, you know, that's something they'll need to uh, keep a close eye yeah, on. Because it's very un- unlikely that the regular plan is charging something lower. So it has to be that if the difference is not exactly that, Correct. then maybe some of the direct plans might be charging higher than what they ideally should be. That's right. Which that's right. in okay. turn impacts the returns of the investor of, of or the long direct, term, yes, right? Yes. Of a direct plan yes, investor. That's right. And point two may not look that great for a one year and basis, mm-hmm. but compound that over a period of 5, 10, 15 years, which Correct. is what scheme should be held, that could be quite a bit. That's right. Okay. So, okay, serious words of caution coming in. And maybe, viewers, again, as Kostov is in saying that if you do not understand this too much, it's best to have some advisor. Maybe talk to your advisors about the, if you have an advisor who's advising you to go into a direct plan, that is, because there are advisors who do that as well. They charge an annual fee and ask you to go into, invest in direct plans. Ask them about what is it that the expenses ratios are and whether uh, it's advisable to consider that very, very seriously. 
Okay. Um, Kostov, any last pieces of advice, something that you've observed in investor behavior over the last two or three months that you think is uh, should be kind of corrected? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I'll probably lay out the pros and the cons, right? So one is I'm glad to see that um, despite we had a pretty sharp correction in July, but the flows remained reasonably rock steady, which is which is great because uh, investors yeah. aren't you know panicking, panicking. or fleeing, uh, fleeing the market, which is great. I hope that continues. Uh, the only one thing, and you know, we kind of started the whole discussion that that you know you need to not rely on because that's that's a data point that we've been trying to study is you know what has been the quantum of flows that's been coming into the short term outperformers, you know, funds that have you know say quartile one or quartile two on a pure say one year basis, and it seems to suggest to us that a lot of money seems to be flowing into you know. Just the well-performing funds. Yeah, the well-performing funds over a short term. Over a short term. You know? yeah. Which is something I think investors need to, because it, it hits you on both sides. One is that, you know, you get into something that's already done a fair bit, and the second, you know, if it doesn't perform to your expectations, you want to flip it around to something else. I think that's something I would I would advise not to do. Uh, in fact, you know, if you have a couple of minutes, I'll just quickly talk about a new study that we plan to publish mm -hmm. soon. Is uh, It's talking about how active managers, they add alpha in a market. Uh, it's actually spread across a very certain number of months, what we call a critical month study. Uh, it's been done globally and we looked at the India data and it doesn't look any different from global context. So, you know, it looks like 5% of the months, you know, if I had a 16 sort of month uh, or a, say 100 month uh, period, uh, just 5% of the months actually contribute to the alpha. So if I, if I wasn't invested in that fund for those five months, even if mm -hmm. the fund's given an alpha and I was invested in only in the 95, the best five months I take away, those 95 months would Actually, I would underperform the index. So the point is that you can't try to time your entry and exit into a fund. You choose a good manager and just stick with them. Okay. Uh, well, I hope that advice is well taken. But, Vastav, it's been a pleasure today. Lots of points okay. covered. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining in Thank you. on the Mutual Fund Show and giving us your thoughts. Thanks. thanks and viewers, thanks for tuning in to this leg of the Mutual Fund Show. Stay tuned to Bloomberg Quinn. places can you be at once? What if we said nine? Bloomberg Quint Live. We are everywhere.